This is the Friday, September 21st, 2018 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now are Elaine Cub and Walt Hackney. Welcome back, guys. Thank you, Elaine. I'm going to start with cotton first, Elaine. Are we showing any any signs of a short-term low in cotton? I hope so. I mean, cotton had a had a rough week, and you know that was probably related to some exporty kind of thing mm -hmm. too. Is you just have these big volatile movements when you have any sort of news in those markets. And it was a shame because, you know, there were bullish ideas that perhaps damage from Hurricane Florence would have been priced into the cotton market bullishly, but that just did not happen this week. So, so yeah, let's hope that, that the big jump downward this week in cotton in, will, will maintain it and it will consolidate upward from here forward. Hopefully, yeah. Walt, I want to ask your thoughts on the hog market. We had a pretty big rally. We've had a nice little rally here since the beginning of September. What's going on there? Um, I think that the uh, domestic demand has surprised a lot of the analytical community that um, 30 days to 90 days ago were predicting again this wall of pork coming at us in the fourth quarter and it, and it isn't there. We're going to continue to kill two million three, two million three five, two million four hogs every week. But we're able to use that product. On well, the and, bellies, right? And like the, you talk yeah, about demand. Exactly. Stuff. That's exactly right, Elaine. And and we're we're seeing a usage factor much greater than the analysts mm -hmm. had expected back when they were forecasting that wall of pork coming at us. You look at the pork, what market in livestock has maintained a stable, less volatile altitude as has pork? There isn't one. Feeder cattle have been like a kid on a Ferris wheel. The fat cattle market has been a busted affair all the way through. Pork has maintained stability which surprised everyone. What about the USDA said they're projecting pork to increase in production about 6.3% here in the fourth quarter. Are we going to see a wall of pork in the first quarter of 2019 then? There's still, you oh, uh, going into the first quarter of 19, I don't know why. Are you going to suggest that the ration costs are going to perpetuate heavier hogs? Probably not. Three dollar corn, soybean meal as the price is as we speak. That probably is not a factor in the market weight of hogs as some had projected it to be back 60, 90 days ago. So as a result, I don't think tonnage, while it's not, it's, it's large. And the, the tariff issue obviously we could use the exports. We could certainly use it. It would only enhance the stability of the hog industry. But right now, it isn't hurting us that much. The fact that we're holding a lot, our cold storage is up, but our domestic usage is doing wonders on that. Poultry is the one that surprised everyone. And, and the usage factor and the overproduction, if you will, in the, po in the poultry has created a, a net loss that's enormous in the poultry industry for the packers and the producer. The packer, on the other hand, is, is making great profits in regard to beef and he's making nice profits in regard to pork. So as long as that continues, we're not going to let a wall of that product uh, influence us one way or another. They're still incentivized to slaughter pork and beef with margins. That's a good word, incentivized. I, I can yeah. hardly get that out. <laughs> but that's a good word because that's exactly right. All right. Let's, let's uh, unpack a couple other things, Elaine. We were talking a little bit here before Market Plus about Argentina and Canada potentially buying or are buying U.S. soybeans to export to China. Fill us in on that. Well, I don't have, well, you know, so that was the thing this week that Argentina was buying mm. U.S. soybean cargoes. And they should because they had a poor harvest and they have a very strong domestic industry of crushing soybeans. So they legitimately need soybeans for their industry. 
I don't have any evidence that Canada has been buying U.S. soybeans yet, but I did look into the price differentials. So like from Pembina, North Dakota up to Morris, Manitoba, there's a dollar sixty-five, and that's U.S. dollars per bushel. Apples to apples comparison. A basis of dollar sixty-five. Yes. And hat tip to Dr. Frain Olson. He walked me through the process of how a U.S. farmer legally could sell soybeans in Canada. They have to pre present a phytosanitary certificate when they cross the, the border mm -hmm. at customs. And then if Canada buys soybeans from a U.S. farmer, if they commingle those soybeans and tried to export them, they would still, China would still have to pay the tariff, or they would still have to pay China's import mm -hmm. tariff on commingled U.S. and Canadian soybeans. But Canada could export Canadian soybeans without a tariff and then backfill their domestic supplies. And that has always sort of been the idea that this is what's going to happen when you disrupt the natural trade patterns, is that other trade patterns will fill around it. And that's always sort of been the idea. And like I mentioned, I don't have any evidence that that's happening into Canada right. yet. But, but it I, could. I, yeah, and, I, you know, that price differential... Price differentials that large, somebody is going to try and take advantage mm -hmm. of that. And, uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's got to happen, right? Canada is buying cargoes of soybeans, even from the United States, and paying the tariffs on them. Uh, a, a big ship loaded in the middle of August, and, and went, knowing that the tariffs would be in place, they sent that ship to China. It's unloaded. They're doing it. Um, the Chinese buyers are politically worried about doing that, but they, they're doing it because they need the soybeans. Brazil's pretty much out of soybeans, mm -hmm. so th it, it will come out of the United yeah. States, and these tariffs are just going to be part of the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, Disruption yeah. of the market. You know, it's an interference in, in the free working of the market. Elaine, with that being said, I think the big question that I feel like I'm asking all the time, and I think producers are asking, is can China then replace their soybean needs this year with shipments from Canada or Argentina or Brazil? I mean, physically, can they do it at this point in time with everything going on? No, no, no. The, the, physically, the numbers is that they will have to buy some shipments from the United States. When? And they are can doing, we expect them to yeah, do that they are now? doing this okay. now. It's just the limited amount, very, mm -hmm. very limited, and not out of the... There's no bid at the Pacific Northwest, so that's very hard on the Western um, states. But they, they have to do it. But what they could do, Delaney, and this is a bigger worry, is, and I think that they have specifically stated that this is their goal, is to find new uh, feed products yeah. to, to work into their pork rations and their poultry rations, you know, rather than feeding soybean meal or, you know, to find ways around this. And that would be very concerning because now you're talking about significantly altering the global supply and demand tables for soybeans and, you know, upwards of 900 million bushels of ending stocks, U.S. soybeans. That would be more bearish. You know, I mentioned on the mm -hmm. show, it's not to say that soybean markets couldn't get worse. They could get worse. They could. Hopefully they, could. they don't. Hopefully but they, they could. Don't. Well, let me ask you then about that. Is it plausible for us to see China switch feed stuffs, I guess, if you want to call it that? Could they switch that much of soybean meal or soybean oil or whatever to a different product? I'm not qualified okay. uh, to answer that, Delaney. Um, it would be definitely in Elaine's category. In Elaine's wheelhouse a little bit no, more. Because I, I, <laughs> I don't know that there would be enough sunflower or cottonseed meal. I, I, There's I probably not enough that, of it. That's it. I don't know the count out there in these mm -hmm. other uh, mm -hmm. items. So I, I'm, I'm a poor one to have an opinion All on right. that. All right. Let's go to our social media questions then, guys. First one here right off the top. Given current very favorable weather in Brazil, how much more early season beans do you expect to be planted? Well, they're planting, and planting is happening fast, and fast, yes, it yes, is. so fast may imply more acres, sure. I don't know how many. Okay. Yeah, I don't, you know, that'd be an interesting study, wouldn't it, if, if, if you could tie, if you could yeah. tie a, a line between a faster planting pace and an equivalent mm -hmm. faster or larger acreage, but I don't have to that. To be determined, To really. be determined. All right. Another question here from Josh in Belmond, Iowa. Green Plains is one of the big consumers of Enogen corn. With this week's news, what impacts do you see on that market? Syngenta pushed that hard in northern Iowa and southern Minnesota especially. Well, the news was sort of news. Like Reuters reported that Green Plains was shutting down a couple of ethanol plants. And then DTN did a follow-up with the CEO, and he said, no, we're not shutting down any mm. ethanol plants. It's just part of our usual seasonal 
on and off. And so some of this is probably just corporate, you know, fake news. Is well, it fake news you know, only? I don't want to say that, but, <laughs> it, you know, just um, managing the optics of the scenario. So. Uh, so I don't know that it's, if you listen to the Green Plains CEO, they're not really shutting down. They're just, you know, doing some maintenance or whatever, okay. and they'll still be buying the energy and corn. So fingers crossed, but, but there would be legitimate reason to be worried about the ethanol profitability right now. Crude oil prices have been taking off, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. that earlier in the show, but, uh, ethanol prices have not. So there's... It would be really wonderful for the ethanol industry to get some good news. Yeah, with some RFS yeah. news, the EPA doing something there with E15 year-round. Yes. Still waiting for the administration. Walt, I've got a good question here for you. Jeremy in Lan Lanark, Illinois, would like to know, is the increased dairy cow slaughter going to be a weight in the protein complex on beef or pork? It's bound to have an effect. Uh, we have seen... Uh, in the past, every time we've had anything like an increase in dairy cow culling, as you will, mm -hmm. uh, that in effect has increased the tonnage production of 80% hamburger. And as a result of that, we've seen a depressing market on the product. Uh, not so much retail going into the meat counter as it has coming back to the cow. And uh, so the rancher, <clears throat> who is suffering to an extent with the drought, mm -hmm. his lack of feed, the cost of feed, the expense of carrying his cow herds, he's also going to be in competition with the dairy cow increase. And that rancher with beef cows is going to also come in with his coal cows and as a result you could see a drop in the value cash value of that product but not not the finished product going into the uh, retail how much of a drop i don't know but uh, you know in that in that industry um <clears throat> beef cows of a callable age um, you're looking at uh, 900 to a thousand dollars a head, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. Usually, are through calving and all of that, and are going to market anyway. And then you couple that with cows that are of a uh, thin position inflation count on the cow carcass. That also is going to affect that market. So, how much it could affect? Ten bucks a hundred. Now that's that's a lot of money. Yeah, it you is. take you take a cow at uh, thousand eleven hundred pounds, and uh, you take ten bucks a hundred. You're looking at a hundred hundred and twenty five dollars a head. Mm -hmm. That's quite a bit. It is quite a bit. Well, you guys have definitely given I think listeners and watchers a lot to chew on this week. Walt Hackney and Elaine Cub, thank you so much. Yep. My pleasure. It's nice meeting you, Elaine. Join us again next week when we'll provide several viewpoints of a government report in another one of our roundtable forums. Darren Newsom, Ted Seifert, Naomi Bloom, and Don Rose will join us at the Market to Market table. Until then, thanks for watching, listening, or reading. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week.